All right, so now we are live. So happy World Oceans Day, everyone. My name is Lucia, and I am here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Hand Pants. Uh, and today, all day long, we have Google Hangouts with awesome ocean explorers and ocean researchers and ocean scientists. And what we love to do is we love to bring adventure, science, and conservation to classrooms around the world. So today, we have classes joining us from, like I said, Ashford, Connecticut, Brampton, Ontario, Ottawa, Ontario, uh, hopefully Sudbury, Ontario, they're having some troubles connecting, and Winnipeg. So we are being joined by Dr. Gavin Hank here. He's a curator of vertebrate zoology at the Royal BC Museum, which is in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, and he's actually described 10 new fossilized fish, but he also loved, loves the mysteries of the deeps, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So enough of me blabbing. How about you take it away, Gavin? All right. Um, hi, Winnipeg. I grew up there. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny. I've gone from the absolute flat prairies and only ever seeing fishes in jars when I was a student at the university to actually now going out and collecting those fish. So uh, I get to do the exploration now instead of just sitting and staring into jars. So what I'll show you guys today are actually the jars themselves of fishes that I've collected. Um, so yeah, go from the prairies to let's jump forward from 1989 when I was looking taking fish biology and learning about specimens in jars to about 2004, I get to move to the Pacific coast. It's a big change. My last Manitoba winter hit minus 54 with the wind chill. Um, and then it jumped to 2006 and I was basically put on board a Coast Guard ship and sent out of sight of land for an entire month. So from the prairies to the open ocean, it was an absolutely fantastic experience. And before anyone wonders, I don't get seasick. I, I wasn't sure. I signed on for a month at sea. It could have been horrible. It was a fantastic experience. So, so basically you live aboard the ship. Uh, they throw out, the, the, the net is an otter trawl, so it's a very large net, not quite as large as the commercial nets, but it's still a very large net. The Coast Guard crew do all the fishing. We're not allowed on deck when, the, when we're actually collecting fish. And we sampled all the way along the BC coastline from north of Haida Gwaii down past Vancouver Island. So it was an amazing place to be. Uh, I saw my first albatross and an ocean sunfish, so again, Really cool experience. Um, the net, imagine this net has uh, steel doors on the side of it that are basically the size of a small car. And when they play that net overboard, it still takes 45 minutes to sink to the bottom. Then the net's hauled along the bottom for a half hour for just, for, we do a standard half hour net pull. And then it's another hour to pull the net up. So your entire day is spent around listening to the winches on the boat as it starts to, you know when the net's going out, and then you know it's a half hour tow, and then, and then 45 minutes later, you can hear the winches pulling the net up. And the Coast Guard crew then drop the fish into a, a hopper in the deck on the boat, and we're down below like a bunch of birds in a nest, waiting for the fish to drop down to us. And we sit and pick through all of that to get all the specimens that, the, well, fisheries and oceans were collecting game fish, but I'm interested in the weird, the creepy, the spiny, the, the, the unusual fish that most people would just toss aside as bycatch. So based on surveys that we've done, well, I wasn't involved in all of these surveys, since 1991, um, we've got over 47 new species of fish for British Columbia. So that's huge. Um, and most of these fishes would not have been identified if someone like myself was not aboard because I specialize on the non-game fish. When in freshwater, I look at minnows, things that most people just use as bait. But for me, that's where the interesting thing is. That's where biology gets really interesting. It's the base of the food chain. The same with these deep sea fish. Other fish will eat them, um, and the, the deep sea food chains are so poorly known. So it is absolutely fascinating to get in there and try to tease apart the diversity of what we have on our coast. So behind me, I've set up a bunch of jars, and uh, I'm going to try show you guys some of the fish uh, that we found. This one's hard to see. Uh, how did it work on the camera there? Yeah, it's basically called a cusk eel, and this is a little one. Uh, they get much larger. 
This one is brand new to British Columbia. So uh, until we looked at this, no one knew it was here. But this one, the funny part was, it was collected in 1976. I think I was in grade six back then. Um, this one was basically, there was a species of fish here on the coast that was split into two. Scientists realized that what they'd got wasn't one single species, it was two variable species, or one variable species, and they split it into two. This is now a new one for BC because they split the original species. So it's, it's kind of cheating. I, I, I could just go into the museum collection and pull this one out. I mean, let's face it, I can't go back in time to look at 1976, but at the museum you can do that. So the museum collection is like a time machine. So that was pretty cool. This one's going to be hard to interpret. I'm almost tempted to pull it out of the jar. It kind of looks like a brown hockey puck, doesn't it? It's an angler fish, and this is a female. Uh, this one also was in the museum collection, and it was misidentified. So part of what I do is go out and explore and collect, but part of what I do is also go through the collection and revise what's, what we have. Uh, this one was misidentified, and when I got it identified correctly, it, again, is a brand new fish for BC. Also very cool. This one is another one of those. They're called dreamers, actually. They're a type of angler fish. It's hard to really see it. But again, it's about the size of a tennis ball. And it's, it's got a little lure on top of its head that lights up. This one hadn't been seen north of something like 38 degrees north. And I got it at 50 degrees north. So we were sampling just north of Vancouver Island. And nobody, this one came up in the net. And we'd sort of piled all of the dreamers together and it hadn't, taken a careful look, and the crew went for lunch, and I picked through them just because, well, I, that's what I do. Um, and this one had a very distinctive lure, and that's how you identify uh, these guys based on the lure. Turns out it's a brand new fish for BC, a huge range extension. Um, so that's really all it takes, and it, I'm not gonna say you have to be smart to do this, you just have to be curious, and you just have to look and notice patterns, funny little patterns jump out at you until you've got a new species. This one came from over a kilometer down. So imagine we're setting nets down a kilometer, quite commonly around 1.7 kilometers. Some of the deeper di or net hauls we did were down in two and a half kilometers of water. So just for the fun of it, what we do is we take styrofoam cups and we write on them, and then we send them down in a bag in the net. And a standard styrofoam coffee cup comes out like a shot glass when it's, it's crushed by the water. So that's the kind of depths that we're dealing with. And down there, it's hit and miss. You, you drop a net down, you get things. You don't know what you're going to get. Every time the net comes up, it's a huge surprise. So absolutely fascinating. This fish, and I'm sure this is the only one you guys are going to remember because of its name. This one came aboard in 2006. And all of the fisheries guys, myself, we, we stopped and we looked at it, and nobody knew what it was. We didn't even know what family of fishes it was. It's called the spiny-eared ass fish. You will never forget that name. Um, this one is so special, it's the only one for the Pacific coastline of North America. I'm not even sure they've shown up in the Atlantic in, in uh, North America. So this is the only one, and we got it. It was, again, pure luck. It's not, I'm not going to say it's skill, because we don't know what we're going to find when we set a net down that deep. But it's all exploration, um, and then, then, it, then you take the time to identify what comes up. This fish, actually, we left unidentified for months after the trip, and it was one of the guys at Fisheries and Oceans that finally got around to dealing with it. This is an eel. They call them sorcerers or witch eels or duck-billed eels. They've got a little tentacle off the tip of their nose, so they're kind of cute. We've been collecting these in BC since the 70s, and nobody recognized them. And it, I actually stopped and took a careful look. And fisheries and oceans, actually, they argued with me. They said, no, no, it's something else. We get them all the time. Well, the fact is they were getting them all the time. They just weren't taking the time to identify them correctly. So I had a lot of fun when I corrected them. Not only do we have this species, we have a second species of this type of eel, and it was a brand new family for BC, just because we took the time to go sampling and, and, and have a look at the, the catch in more detail. So uh, absolutely hilarious. 
And for me to see them fresh was a real bonus because as a student, all I saw were pickled specimens that are sort of peanut butter brown in a jar. So it, it was really fascinating to see them live. I can't say they all smell very good, but uh, it, it's, it's still a very cool experience. So imagine Winnipeg, any one of you guys could move to the coast and take over when I retire. You can, you can be doing this kind of work. How are we doing for time? Three yep, three minutes. This is another fish. It's another type of cusk eel. It's a black cusk eel. Yeah, it's really pretty, isn't it? Yeah, ooh, yeah. They all kind of look like this after a while. They, they, none of the fish hold their color in the alcohol and formaldehyde, so it's kind of sad that they don't, but to be honest, this one was black anyway. This fish is normally found around Baja, California, down to Panama. So we found one off the BC coast. There's a, and, and it, they probably live here regularly. We just happen to luck out, and this is the only one. And I think that was also too, no, this was, do, 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 can't even see a year. Oh, it's 2006 as well. So yeah, we got that one. Most of these fish, because we don't carry a lot of books on, on board the ship when we're actually sampling, we, uh, we save them and identify them later in the lab. So it's, it's, it's a little meticulous and fussy work, but it is, it is very rewarding. Um, should we go to the, yeah, like, how did you do that again? Yeah. We'll, we'll share, we'll share, I'll show you a few slides. You might be able to, the, the fish might look a little better in the slides. Uh -huh. And let's go slideshow on that. So that's the actual ship. That's the, uh, the W.E. Ricker. Um, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but uh, my, my profile picture for the, for the uh, hangout was obviously me in a stormtrooper outfit. If you look carefully on the, on the bridge of the ship up top, and on the, uh, the, the actual gangway to get down on the dock, I photoshopped in a few stormtroopers in there. So I'm sorry I couldn't resist it. I'm a bit of a nerd. Here's the actual net itself going out. And at the back of the boat, I don't know if you can see the mouse moving here, those are the doors, the otter doors that actually hold the net open when it's on the seafloor. Uh, these balls are about the size of a basketball. So that'll kind of give you an idea of how big the net is. And this is the hopper where they dump the fish down. And so I'm below that deck waiting for fish to come up. If you do get seasick, I don't recommend this because there's no windows. So the boat is pitching and tossing. And here they are dumping a bunch of fish down below deck. And uh, so you can imagine that's about another 10 feet down to where all the scientists are waiting. And so you've got the, the pitching and tossing deck, the smell of the fish, it's right by the engine room, so there's diesel as well. So while it's an experience uh, just being at sea, it's also an experience if you're, uh, you're a little queasy. Here's a couple of the fish, just to show a few range maps. These are the duck-billed eels. There's the little tentacle on its nose right there. Um, there's no sense showing the whole eel because it's just a long ribbon. But there, that'll give you an idea of how far we sampled. We were up and down the BC coast. This is a bobtail eel. It's the only one for this part of the coast. Um, we got one specimen and that's really it. It's got a stubby little tail, tiny little thing. This one, the, the cutthroat eel, it's the only one we have for BC. Cusk eel, this one, I can't say, this is kind of cheating. It actually wasn't from the same sampling trip. So it was actually one of the few fish I've worked on that was found in shallow water. So that's, that's also very cool. So it's not always deep sea exploration. In fact, last year we got our very first angel shark in BC just because some divers found it. There's the black cusk eel, the one that was in, in the jar. And again, only one specimen for this part of the coast, north of say uh, Baja. And then this one, this one's so crazy, it doesn't even have a, a common name. But again, up and down the coast, nobody knew it was here until we bothered to take the time to identify it carefully. Uh, this guy hasn't been found north of Oregon. We now know it's here. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun because I get to work with people as far away as Copenhagen to get these fish identified. So it's, it's a great collaborative work. It's not just BC researchers working on this. We've got people up and down the coast and over in Europe. So anyway, yeah, this fish actually is still in Copenhagen. The guys that are working on it are uh, revising the entire group. So they said, could we please borrow your dead fish? And so I mailed it off. I'm sure the postman has no idea what he's shipping when I send a fish across. But uh, but anyway, so that's 
that's just a few of the faces of the fish that we've got um, on that uh, that trip that last little while. So it's 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 been an absolutely fabulous experience. And you know, coming from the flat prairies, I never thought I would ever be doing that. I, I for a while I worked at the Manitoba Museum, so I thought that would be my career. But uh, you know, when I got the opportunity to move out to the Pacific Coast, I couldn't help but uh, jump at it. Awesome, awesome, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, so uh, we can so do a round of questions, questions with everyone. With everyone. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with uh, Miss Brothers class. Do you guys have a question? Do you have any questions? Not right now. Okay. <laughs> have to let them think. Yeah. All right. You guys think on that. We can jump to Mr. Blondo's class. Hey. Hey. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How many fish do you catch on average? Um, a net, any one net haul could have um, anywhere from no fish to hundreds of fish. So then we don't haul long enough to get thousands because a trawl net, I have to admit, trawl nets are damaging to the seafloor. So we don't, we don't haul for any longer than we have to. So a half hour haul is only a few kilometers. But yeah, you'll get a, you'll generally get a couple of hundred fish in a sample. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, now we can go to Miss Imhoff's class. Do we have a question yep. from your class? All right, Quinn, just stand right in front of the computer. Um, what do you like best about your job? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I think the the real surprise about museum work. I, I think. People might think it's boring and we do the same thing every day. The fact is, I can come into work and have no idea what I'm going to do from day to day. So yesterday I was working on some First Nations masks and identifying the feathers that were on the masks. Another day, well, look at today, I'm talking to you guys. Um, other days I'm in the collection, correcting, finding mistakes, re renumbering fish. Other times I'm out on the beach sampling. Uh, so yeah, it's the the whole point is that um, you never know. It's it's every day is different, and I think that's what makes the job really interesting. Awesome, uh, Miss Hastings Speck. Do you guys have a question? Have you ever found any octopus? <laughs> yeah, almost every year we find octopus. Yeah. <laughs> And, and some of the octopus we find are, are very strange deep sea species that I didn't even know existed. So I work on fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, I don't study invertebrates. So when the deep sea squid and the deep sea octopus started coming up, they were completely foreign to me. And, and I still don't know what species are out there. Um, I can only fill my brain with so much information. But it was fascinating. We, we got some very creepy looking octopus. Awesome. I know Miss Blanchard's class, I know we have trouble hearing you guys, but if you want, you can type your question in to the side there. Nope. Not, no. Yeah, we still can't hear you. <laughs> so you can type them onto our group chat. It's a little blue box on the left side of the Google uh, Hangout. So if there's a question there, you can type it in. <laughs> So we'll wait in anticipation to see what the question is. So we are wondering, what is the weirdest fish you have ever found? Ooh, the weirdest fish. I think probably the one that's, it's, it's bizarre, it's soft, it's flabby, the spines on the back of the gills, uh, the, the spiny eared ass fish has to be the strangest fish we've ever collected. Uh, it's the first record for North America. Uh, I, I used the fish in an exhibit a little while ago and it went viral because of the name of the fish. So it, it certainly got me some, some press. But it's, I think the, the strangest thing about it is that it came up in the net and six scientists stood there scratching their heads. They had no idea what it was and it was months after before we finally got it identified. The silly thing is, it's it was first collected and identified back in I think the 1800s. So it's not like it's a new fish. We just 
it's just a new one for us. And so that's I think that's what made it so cool. Awesome. Uh, Miss Brothers class, you guys have a question? Oh, the name. Oh. Well, we're going to ask what the most interesting fish was that he's found, but it was kind of just <laughs> a answered in the last question. So. Okay. <laughs> so you guys want to think about another question? We'll get back to you. Oh, okay. What's your favorite animal that you've caught? Fish. Oh, favorite animal. Well, I, I also work on lizards. I got all kinds of noise there. I also work on lizards, so I mean, uh, I can't really say I have a favorite. Um, hmm, it's very tough. I used to have a pet caiman, it's like a small alligator. Um, I now have a four-year-old daughter, so I won't have a pet like that anymore because they are dangerous. But I have to admit, he was probably my most entertaining pet, and I, I really do like crocodilia. It's not fish, I know, but... Uh, that's that's part of my job. I get to work on so many different things that I can. I don't have to specialize and focus. I can I can be scattered and and still get away with it. That's good. And I know when you were holding up the anglerfish, you specifically said it was a female anglerfish. How do you tell the difference between a female and a male? Well, the the males are basically like a little stick. <laughs> the males attach to the females by their mouth, and they actually draw nutrition from the female's blood. And they, they're almost like, a, uh, almost like a leech or a, a parasite. They hang on to the female and stay with her for the rest of her life. And they're there ready to mate when the female is going to, when she's ready to produce eggs. So, um, yeah, the males are just wee little sticks. Strangely enough, we haven't seen any anglerfish from BC with males attached to them. So further south along the coast, we find them with males. Uh, not up here. So uh, I've been talking with one of the anglerfish experts around the world. Well, he's actually in Seattle, luckily for me. Um, but he hasn't got an explanation for it yet. Yeah, interesting. All right, Mr. Blondo's class, do you guys have another question? What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? The biggest fish? Uh, I have a, in the freezer right now, I have a nine foot six gill shark. Oh. And I'm going to try to get it. It's kind of hard. The camera's messing with the perspective. But huh, how big is his head? His head is wider than a basketball. I'll give you that. So it's a very big fish. Uh, nine feet long, absolutely massive, powerful jaws. And it washed up just off the uh, Victoria Beach, co uh, off our coastline, right here around town. Wow, impressive. I'm still waiting for my very first great white shark. I'm just, oh, I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then Miss Imhoff class, do we have another question? Yeah, everyone's coming up to the camera. What was, how heavy are usually a full net of fish? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, we, what we do is we record numbers of fish and then we record the weight of each species. So if we've got viper fish, we'll ha know how many grams of viper fish we have. Um, with some of the big cusk eels, we'll ha and the, the grenadiers, they're, they're a completely different group of fish, we'll, we'll weigh them independently. We don't weigh everything as one big unit, but um, it could easily be 500 pounds to 1,000 pounds of fish. You know, some Depends on the net. Some nets come up and they're fairly empty. Some nets come up and they're chalked full. Yeah, it, it, it really varies. Uh, then Ms. Hastings Speck, do you have another question? We had a question in the uh, group chat about how did you come up with the name? Oh, yeah. Oh. Is that, I'm, I'm assuming that's referring to the ass fish? Yes. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't name it. And so the Latin name of that fish is Acanthonus. And I think it's Greek, so onus means donkey. And so instead of calling it a donkey fish, and the other nickname for a donkey is an ass, so they said it's an ass fish. So uh, I didn't name it, and it's been known as that for a long time. Um, the fish that I've named have very boring names, I'm sorry. They're, and they're all straight Latin. I have none of my fish, they're about 400 million years old. None of those fish actually have common names. All right, and I have a question. Uh, today I talked to a lot in other hangouts about like plastic in our oceans. So when you do these 
put out these nets. Are you pulling up garbage? Are you finding a lot of garbage? No, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, we were we were sampling in about 1.9 kilometers depth of water, and we got the classic fishing boot. We have found old cans from, uh, and I hate to say it, but it's beer cans, uh, and these are way off, way out of sight of land, and they're on the sea floor, so they've sunk. And the strangest thing, we found a skipping rope. We were probably outside of Canadian waters, sampling in super deep water, and we found a skipping rope. It was the funniest thing. So yeah, we do get garbage, not tons of it, but we do get it. Um, Is there something you see more, like a type of garbage that more commonly comes up in the net? Uh, no, it's, it's very random, yeah. Okay. But I mean, I've, a few years ago, I sampled and, and hiked around on Haida Gwaii, and this is, it's, it's depressing to admit this, but there wasn't a beach, and this is pre-tsunami debris, there wasn't a beach anywhere without garbage on it. Wow. And um, it, I'm talking stray nets, uh, oil, jugs of oil, um, and some of it still had oil left in it, so it had fallen off a boat. I found a rice wine bottle that still had wine in it, or, you know, I guess it was sake, it still had it in there. It smelled very strong, so it hadn't, hadn't uh, leaked at all. I did not drink it, um, but yeah, we found a pair of Blundstone boots. We found, I found a really cool little MG plastic car toy, you know, and who knows where that came from, but this stuff yeah. just was in, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so we can do one more round of questions. So, Miss Brothers, do you guys have another question you'd like to ask? No. Uh, what's your favorite fish? Well, oh, my favorite, well, I mean, I, I love sharks. I, I work on fossil sharks. I mean, I'm still eagerly awaiting my first great white shark. I've never seen one in the wild. Um, so, yeah, I mean, let's face it. As a kid, I was smuggled into uh, the um, drive-in, which was out just west of uh, Westwood in Winnipeg, um, to go see Jaws when I was a little kid. And my mom covered my eyes during the scariest bits. But ever since then, I've been hooked on great white sharks. But it's, they're so hit and miss up here that I, it's not like I can go out and actually study them because, I mean, they come up in the summer and then they move south in the winter. Um, so if I get one, it'll be a lucky chance, probably one that stayed too late and washed up on the shore. So I think, yeah, great white has to be the ultimate fish. <laughs> uh, then Ms. Imhoff's class, do you have a final question? I think Donnie's actually might be the most relevant right now. <laughs> has a fish ever has a fish ever attacked you? Oh, that's embarrassing a question. I have been I have been bitten by more things than I care to admit. Uh, I I do it's probably I'm going to try to see if I can show you this. Uh, angle it on the camera here. There's a little circle on my hand. Mm -hmm. That is actually, I got six stitches. Uh, I got bitten by a piranha. <laughs> and it took a chunk out of my hand. Uh, I used to work in a pet store. When oh. I was doing my undergrad, I worked in a pet store. And yeah, I've also got little bites from smaller piranha, but that one actually required stitches. I've been bitten by one shark. I've had one venomous snake bite. I've been attacked by a 12-foot python. So I'm surprised I'm as unscarred as I am because I've, I've, yeah. <laughs> and then our final question will be from Miss Hastings Beth's class. Any other questions, guys? I think we're actually done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, then we will end on all the different animals that bit. Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> That's excluding dogs and things like that. Yeah. You? <laughs> All the unique animals that pitch. Oh, yeah. The unusual stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for hanging out with us today. It's been a lot really of great learning about all this fish in the deep sea. Uh, I'll unmute everyone and everyone can kind of say goodbye to Gavin so you guys can wave and say goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.